Successful spinal anesthesia requires two things to happen. First, that we get the needle into the vertebral canal and intrathecal space to deliver local anesthetic. And second, that the drug we inject results in adequate surgical anesthesia for the specific operation in question. Failing to achieve the first step is technical or primary failure, which is what defines difficulty in spinal anesthesia for most of us. This video will describe what I consider to be the three foundational skill sets for technical success when performing spinal anesthesia. Anatomical knowledge is the foundation of all regional anesthesia, but it goes beyond just textbook anatomy, putting labels onto a two-dimensional picture. To be really effective, you want to be able to hold a three-dimensional model in your mind, in this case, the lumbar spine and to be able to visualize its contours and component parts when you're looking at it from different angles. An Anatomy Atlas or app is a good starting point, but I recommend also spending hands-on time with an actual model of the spine, looking at lots of CT and MRI scans, and if you have the opportunity, observing dissection in cadavers or even major open spine surgery. Because the classic problem in difficult spinal anesthesia is constantly hitting bone. To be able to solve this, we must be able to answer the question, what part of the bony spine am I touching with my needle? We must be able to make an educated guess or assumption, and then to test that assumption with systematic redirections. It's as though you're trying to make your way across a dark room from one door to another. You have the equivalent of a blind person's tapping stick, which is your needle, to feel your way across but it's so much more helpful when you know the layout of the room and the obstacles that you're likely to encounter. There are a few simple guiding principles, particularly if you're using a midline approach. First, any bone that you contact at a shallow depth, say with your 40 millimeter skin infiltration needle, is going to be the tip of the spinous process. The average anterior posterior length of the adult lumbar spinous processes are about three and a half centimeters. So unless your patient is literally skin and bone, it's highly unlikely that you'll reach that lamina or the canal with this needle. If you do touch deeper bone and you elicit pain, you should ask the following questions. And if the patient localizes this pain to their back, not their leg, and reports it as on their right or left versus the middle of their back, then you've contacted the highly innovated facet joint of the articular processes. And this means you're definitely off the midline and much too lateral for success with either the midline or paraspinous approach. If you touch bone without eliciting pain, but your subsequent cranial redirections result in bony contact at a similar depth each time, which kind of feels like you're walking your needle up a vertical wall, then this is almost certainly the lamina. And once again, you're too lateral and off the midline. Now, if you happen to know which side of the midline you're on, left or right, you could angle slightly medially, 10 degrees or so, and perform a paraspinous approach. Otherwise, you'll have to do a parallel shift of your needle to find the true neuraxial midline. If you've been meticulous about locating the midline of the bony spine, ideally using your skin infiltration needle as a seeker, how I've demonstrated in detail elsewhere, then cranial redirections should result in bony contact at increasing depths, signifying that you're walking along the cranial border of the lower spinous process towards its base, and thus you should eventually slip into the interlaminar space. If, however, you suddenly contact bone at a shallower depth, then it's likely that you've overshot the correct trajectory, and now you're striking the upper spinous process. And this can be a result of redirections that are too large or because the patient has a narrowed interspinal space from degenerative disease or poor positioning. At the same time, there's a lot more information that we can get from our needle tip than just bony contact. With a little bit of deliberate, mindful practice and slow, smooth motion, you can sense the different layers and tissues that you're passing through. Skin, subcutaneous fat, supraspinous, interspinous ligaments, paraspinal muscles, ligamentum flavum, all of them have a characteristic feel. And this provides important clues as to whether we're progressing along the right track or not. I always start this process with my skin infiltration needle. 
I use this as a seeker to explore the superficial tissues. Unless the patient has very thick subcutaneous tissues, we can usually define the location of the spinous process, the interspinous space, and the midline through a combination of bony contact and resistance to fluid injection. And this sets us up to start our needle insertion with the introducer or spinal needle in the optimal site. Precise needle insertion and handling is the third foundational skill set to master if you want to optimize for success in spinal anesthesia. And it begins with starting in the right place. I'm not just talking about the longitudinal axis and being in the midline of the spine, but the transverse plane. And this can be critical to success, whether you're using midline or paraspinous approaches, but especially so for the midline and particularly in challenging patients. In general, you always want to start in the caudal half of the interspinous space, close to the lower spinous process. And in the difficult patient with narrowed interspinous spaces, this choice of insertion site becomes even more critical because there's only a very small range of trajectories that will allow the needle to navigate all the way to the interlaminar space. The paraspinous approach is much more forgiving in this respect. You don't need quite the same degree of precision, which is one of its advantages. The next point to be mindful of is to ensure that you're advancing in a straight line. Don't bend needles or let them deviate off course. It should be obvious why this is critical for accuracy in reaching the target that we're aiming for. The key is to be aware that bending or deviation may be happening, particularly with the thinner, more flexible needles. If you're mindful, you can both see and feel the shaft bending. And then you should adjust your grip and force application accordingly. Personally speaking, I often vary how I hold the needle depending on the type of needle I'm using, the position of the patient, and other circumstances, something that I go through in depth in another video. Needle movements should also be smooth, small, and systematic. Smooth is about focusing on feel, that tactile sense we talked about, being delicate yet controlled, in other words, having some finesse. Changes in angulation must be small, as these can translate into significantly large displacements in needle tip location, which will be magnified by increased depth to the target, as in an obese patient and when we're using longer needles. And we've already talked about the importance of systematic redirections based on tactile feedback and your mental model of the spine. Don't just dig around haphazardly. Consider what part of the vertebrae you're contacting and adjust your trajectory accordingly constantly updating your mental map. This need to make smooth, small movements and to travel in straight lines is why in difficult patients, I often revert to a larger gauge cutting tip needle. I've talked about this elsewhere and there's good evidence that it does not materially increase the risk of posterior puncture headache in the older, non-obstetric population. So in difficult spinals, I think it's worth the trade-off for increased success. Finally, skin control is essential to precise and accurate needle handling. Skin is mobile, more in some patients than others. And millimeters matter, especially in challenging patients with narrowed or deep interlaminar spaces. Precision of needle advancement is critical. Don't let the uncontrolled drift of skin over the underlying spine be one more factor that takes you off target. Always therefore use two fingers for palpating spinous processes, not your thumb. Keep the fingers close together when palpating, which simulates your thumb, and then use the tips of your fingers, not the whole pad, for maximum sensitivity. Then you can spread the same two fingers to straddle the spinous processes and fix skin in position for needle insertion. You can also use the two fingers to make small and subtle shifts of the skin as needed, allowing you to make similarly small and subtle changes to where you're starting your needle insertion 
and more importantly, where you're landing with respect to the bony spine without necessarily making another hole in the patient. These might all seem like unnecessarily fussy details, but it's been my experience over the thousands of spinal anesthetics that I've observed and performed that when the going gets really tough, it's these details that matter. And before I find myself in these challenging situations, I want to have already incorporated and committed these behaviors to muscle memory to have them as my habitual and routine behaviors, which is why I personally practice them in every single spinal, difficult or not, and I encourage you to do the same.